All right, praise the Lord. You got your Bibles with you? Let's open them, first of all, to Psalm 77. And while you're turning there, uh, I want to make a couple of statements to you. Many years ago, and I've mentioned this before, Brother Hagen, Brother Copeland, and Brother Roberts, my three mentors, they all uh, had a prophetic word over me, and they all said it within a couple of months of each other. Brother Hagen, uh, well, Brother Copeland said it first, and then shortly after that, I was with Brother Hagen, and he was not in that meeting Brother Copeland and I were doing, and he said a very similar thing, called me up and gave me a word from the Lord. And then not too long after that, uh, Brother Roberts called me, and I was preaching with Brother Copeland in uh, Anaheim, and Brother Roberts called and said, uh, Jerry, when are you speaking again? in this convention. I said, actually, I'm preaching tonight, Brother Roberts. He said, well, tell uh, Carolyn to save Evelyn and I a seat. We're going to be there to hear you. And I said, well, come early if you can and let me say hello to you before I go out to speak. So they did, and we just met them in the speaker's room for a brief time, and then they were escorted out to sit with Carolyn during the meeting. After uh, the service, he came back to me before he and Evelyn went home. And he said, uh, the Lord said something to me while you were preaching tonight, and I'm not going to tell you what it was, but I'm going to write it to you in a letter. So be expecting a letter from me uh, when you get home. So not too long after I arrived back home, I got a four-page handwritten letter from Brother Roberts. And uh, he said a number of things, obviously, in four pages, but the gist of it was, he said, when I heard you preaching at Brother Copeland's Believers Convention last week, I heard you preaching prophetically. And he said, now I want to encourage you that every time you go to the pulpit, draw from that anointing. Preach prophetically because God wants to use you in that area. Now, Brother Hagen had said just a short time before when I was with him in Riverside, California, he said, Brother Jerry, uh, God is moving you into a new dimension of ministry, and it's time for you to move in, move up, and then move out in it. And then after the service, he began to talk to me about the prophetic ministry. And that's the same thing Brother Copeland said just a month before that uh, in Fort Worth, where he said, as I was getting ready to preach that night, he said, God is moving you into a new dimension of ministry, He's calling you to be a seer into the spirit realm. And what God shows you, he will hold you responsible for, share it, for sharing it to the body of Christ wherever he sends you. So that was as far back as 1981. And uh, so since that time, I have endeavored, particularly uh, during the month of October every year, to set some time aside just to seek the Lord as to what's on his agenda for the coming new year. Somebody said, you can do that? Well, of course. The Bible says, Jesus himself speaking, or when the Holy Spirit has come, he will show you things to come. I don't like to be the last one to find out what God's up to. I like to be an insider. Amen. I, li I like to know what's going to happen in advance. And we can know those things. Somebody said, well, God's never said anything to me about it. Well, maybe not spend enough time with him. Thank you for your enthusiasm over that revelation. <laughs> Amen. He will show you things to come, but you're not going to watch six hours of CNN and then run in there and say, God, what's happening? <laughs> you know, spend six hours with God and you'll know what's happening. Amen. Uh, CNN can only report what is happening now and maybe tomorrow. But that's about as far as they can go. But God knows all things, amen? amen. He sees all things. Amen. And so uh, based on that, and, and the reason I'm telling you that is because Brother Hagin told me one time, he said, uh, he said when, when the Lord visited me and caused his anointing to come in my hands, he said, I didn't tell it sometimes because... Uh, you know, I didn't want people to think, and I'm trying to 
make something of myself that I'm not. He said, but the Lord said, if you will tell it, then they will expect the anointing to be stronger. And he said, tell it, Brother Jerry. Tell what God has, has done with you. So that's the reason I'm telling you. Because I want you to expect something from God tonight that is on his agenda for you. Hallelujah. Look at your neighbor and say, you got my attention. <laughs> Amen. So uh, based on that, there are four specific things the Lord has said to me about 2021 up to now. In October of last year, when this all began, when I was seeking him about what's on his agenda for 2021, the first thing he said to me was, it will be a year of abundant overflow. A year of abundant overflow. So I wrote that down and I prayed over it and then I took that to my church back home and usually uh, uh, that's the first place I will preach it and I'll spend about three weeks uh, sharing that message with them and encouraging them to become expectant for that to take place in their life, mix their faith with it, because the Bible says, uh, if you don't mix faith with the word priest, it won't profit you. And so I encourage them to mix their faith with it. And then shortly after that, I take those sermons and I, and I put it in a new book. And that's what this book is about, Living in God's Abundant Overflow. And uh, by the way, this is my 82nd book in 52 years, praise God. I, uh, I asked my publication department one time, uh, some time back, I said, how many books have I produced? And they said, uh, no, I said to them, I said, I plan to, to, to do at least 100 books before the Lord returns. They said, Brother Jerry, you've already got over 80. You already have 80. I said, then I'm going to produce 200 books before the Lord returns. <laughs> So this is number 82, praise God. Amen. And uh, it's principles of how to position yourself to experience abundant overflow. Amen. And I show you scriptures throughout the word of how that it is the will of God. Not that we just barely get by or just exist, but God wants us to, to tap into abundant overflow, praise God. And not only that, I have autographed them for you if you're interested in that. So go back there and and uh, if there's some left on the table, take advantage of it. And then the second thing he said to me was this. And this, this came shortly after the new year began. He said it will be an, uh, an unprecedented outpouring of the goodness of God. An unprecedented outpouring of the goodness of God. So I began to add that to this teaching on abundant overflow. Now, I didn't know at the time... Uh, until my first meeting with Brother Copeland this year, earlier this year, that the Lord had been talking to him about uh, the goodness of God. And he said, preach on the goodness of God. And so we were in a meeting together and he was preaching on the goodness of God. I was preaching on the goodness of God. And praise God, we had an outpouring of the goodness of God because God confirms the word with signs following. Amen. And then the third thing the Lord said to me, was it will be a year of first, first, things that have never happened to you quite like this before. I like that. That's what I'm going to talk about tonight. A year of first. And then just uh, a couple of weeks ago, going into the Southwest Believers Convention in Fort Worth, the Lord said to me that it will be a year of restoration, a year of recovery, and a year of recompense. God will make your adversary pay for what he has put you through this year. Amen. I think we ought to give God a, a praise in advance. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So with that in mind, let's look at Psalm 77. And of course, I don't have time to talk about all those things, uh, but we do have all of those messages already recorded and in book form and so forth, and I'm sure that they're out there on the table if you're interested. Now, Psalm 77, beginning in verse 11, it says, I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember thy wonders of old. I will meditate also of all thy works and talk of thy doings. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? 
Thou art the God that doest wonders. Now, I wrote in my notes after the Lord led me to this, uh, and, and I, I just want to read it the way that I put it in my notes. There are some memories that are just so special that you cherish them forever, especially when God has brought you through situations that looked impossible or blessings that surprised and overwhelmed you when they manifested or things you experienced for the very first time and realizing that only God could have made that happen. Now, I've experienced that many, many times. In fact, I began experiencing that shortly after I gave my life to the Lord in 1969. Uh, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it, but I understand what this psalmist is saying. I will remember uh, your works of old. You know, I'm still telling stories that happened to me 52 years ago. I'm still giving testimonies of things that happened to Carolyn and I, our children, our ministry, that happened to us a long, long time ago. I think it's important that you recall from time to time the things that God has already done for you. Yes. Amen. Amen. It, it, it helps you because if you recall them from time to time, then it inspires you. It causes you to think, well, he's done it before. Why can't he do it again? Hallelujah. Can you say amen? amen? So I remember shortly after I came to the Lord in February 1969, of course, I didn't know anything about the Bible. Like Brother Copeland says, when he came to the Lord in 1962, uh, he said um, he was a scripturally illiterate. Well, I knew exactly what he was talking about because I, you know, I knew John 3:16, and uh, I'd heard that from a kid. But that, that was the extent of what I knew about the Bible. I thought it was just a, a history book, a story book. I didn't have any idea that you could live by it today, you know. And so uh, after I surrendered my life to the Lord and began to study the Bible, uh, man, I got so excited I couldn't get enough of it. I had a quest to know God. I had a quest to know His Word. In fact, some of the church uh, people where I began going to church, the church that Carolyn grew up in, um, they had been praying for me for a long time, ever since Carolyn and I married. And see, this happened three years after our marriage. And uh, during that first three years of our marriage, we, we, were, uh, we were tolerating each other. We were two people living under the same roof, going two different directions. She lived for God, I lived for Jerry. I was living my dream, she was living her dream, and her dream was to serve God. My dream was to own my own automotive business, race cars, restore classic automobiles, and build hot rods, and, and go fast everywhere I went. In fact, if, if Carolyn wanted me to go to church with her, and she'd beg me every Sunday, please go to church with me, I said, Carolyn, if I go to church with you, we're not going in your car. She said, why not? I said, you drive a Falcon <laughs> with a six-cylinder engine. I'm not going in that thing. I have a reputation in this city. I cannot be seen in that car. <laughs> I said, if, you go, if I go to church with you, which I probably will not, you're going to go with me in my 65 GTO. You know, with three deuces and a four-speed. Hallelujah. She said, no, you'll race everything between here and the church. I said, you got that right. There's not even an old woman in a Volkswagen going to beat me to the next light. She said, I'm not riding in your car. I said, well, I'm not going in your car, so you go to church, and I'm staying home. <laughs> but every once in a while, she'd get me to go. And, uh, and then when I, particularly when I surrendered my life to the Lord, uh, I wanted to be in church. I wanted to learn about God. I wanted to learn the Bible. But I couldn't find a whole lot of people that knew anything about faith. Uh, all I'd ever hear was, you ought to have faith. Well, I agreed with him, you ought to have faith. But tell me how to get it. Well, it seemed like nobody could tell me how to get it. And then they'd tell me what faith could do. Well, I believe faith could do anything if you had it, but we don't know how to get it. You know? And then, you know, uh, they'd, they'd make statements like, um, nothing is impossible with God. I'd say, I agree with that. 
And then I'd say, well, how do you get him to do something? And then they'd say this, you never know what God will do. I thought, this is the mixed up as people I ever met in my life. <laughs> they want me to be just like them. I don't want to be like them. I want to be different. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And so eventually, <laughs> uh, I, I couldn't just warm the bench, but that's what they wanted me to do. They didn't want me. One, one, one of the ministers there said, Brother, well, he didn't call me Brother Jerry yet. Jerry, don't rock the boat. Just sit there and listen and do what we tell you to do. I said, sir, I'm sorry. I can't do that. I'm a boat rocker. <laughs> Amen. I, I, I'm not satisfied with just hearing I want to do. Amen. And I found out that the Bible said, don't be a hearer only, be a doer. Amen. 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 And it got to the point, sometimes when I'd come in the church, people would walk the other way. <laughs> you know, because I was being labeled a fanatic. He's gone too far. One, one of the ministers there in the church said, uh, I wish you wouldn't uh, spend so much time studying those sermons of Kenneth Copeland's. I said, why not? He said, he's an extremist. I said, what is that? Well, he couldn't explain it. And he finally said, he doesn't preach the whole counsel of God. And so, you know, I didn't really know what he meant. But, you know, the more I listened to Kenneth Copeland, I became an extremist. I became extremely blessed, extremely well, extremely prosperous, extremely healed. And I went back and told him, I said, sir, you're too late. I'm an extremist too. <laughs> I remember one time I was with Brother Copeland back in those early days. And uh, we were in a meeting and, of course, I was just his sidekick, you know. And I'd hold his Bible while he'd talking to people and, and uh, get him back to the hotel. And, you know, I, I, I was we Savell. Brother Copeland said, we going to do this, we going to do that. I was we Savell. I did everything. <laughs> It was just Brother Copeland, Gloria, and Jerry Savelle back in those early days. That was the Kenneth Copeland Evangelistic Association. And I like to remind him today that when I left as a full-time employee, it took 500 people to replace me. <laughs> Amen. And so uh, we're, we're in this meeting, and I'm standing next to him, and this this preacher said to him, Kenneth Copeland, you don't preach the whole counsel of God. Now, I'm, I'm standing there, cause, you know, and I'm, I'm listening. I, I, I'm listening to every word he said. And I, I'm, I'm curious as to how he's going to respond to this. And I thought, all right, boy, we're going to get some revelation now. <laughs> Kenneth Copeland, you don't preach the whole counsel of God. And he said, you're right. I said, what? <laughs> you're right? He said, you're right. I don't preach the whole counsel of God. I don't know the whole counsel of God. As soon as I know it, I'll preach it. But the part I know, that's what I preach. Hallelujah. I said, yeah, that's what we do. Praise God. Amen. Well, we're, we're, we're in this meeting with Brother Copeland, and I haven't moved, to Shreveport, uh, moved from Shreveport to Fort Worth yet. And this is the second visit of Kenneth Copeland to Life Tabernacle in Shreveport. And we're sitting there. I mean, I'm, I have gone from back row Christian to front row Christian. I could hardly wait for them to turn Brother Copeland loose. Just let him teach. I just wanted to learn the word. And he was there for a week, three services a day. And uh, <clears throat> the last morning service, uh, we're sitting there, and he's teaching from Mark chapter 4 about the sower sows the word. And he made the statement that once the word is sown, Satan comes immediately to steal the word. And about that time, we heard a scream in the nursery or in the hallway. It sounded like a, a child. And he got closer and closer to the auditorium. And the nursery attendant come through the side door, and she had Terry, my youngest daughter, in her arms, Terry screaming at the top of her voice, blood's all over that nursery attendant's uniform. I don't have a clue what's happened. And she says, Brother Jerry, Brother Jerry. Well, I stood up, Brother Copeland looked, and the whole church 
turned their attention to the nursery attendant. I got up to take Terry, and I put her in my arms, and she's screaming at the top of her voice. I still don't know what's happened to her yet. And uh, even though I don't know what's happened, obviously she's in pain. Something has happened. Seriously? Serious? Something serious has happened, I'm trying to say. So I immediately turned to look at Brother Copeland to see how he was going to respond because it happened in his service. We're going to find out now if he really believes this stuff or he's just preaching. Amen? It's like Kenneth Hagin Jr. told his mama one time, said uh, when he was a little boy, Mama, does Daddy really believe all that or is he just preaching? <laughs> you know? Well, we find, we're about to find out if Kenneth Copeland believes this. And, and I looked at him because in my mind, I thought, if he, if he walks off or if he gets rattled over this or if he doesn't do what he said that he does, then I'm out of here. Now, I didn't mean to hang my faith on what he was going to do, but at the time, I'm so young in the Lord, that's the only thing else I could do. You understand what I'm saying? Because I don't know anybody else that, that preached the message of faith like he did. And so now I want to see how he responds. Well, back in those days, they wore those lavalier mics with a cord around them, and you could just go so far with them, you know? And he's on the platform. So he takes that mic off and walks up to Terry without even knowing what happened and just laid his hands on her. And in about this tone of voice, he said, I command the pain to cease and the bleeding to stop in the name of Jesus. And immediately, Terry stopped crying. The bleeding stopped. And she laid her hand over my shoulder. And then Brother Copeland said, Now, I'm not done. Pay attention to me. And he went back to preaching. Well, I walked out and went to the men's restroom because I got blood all over me. I still don't know what's happened to Terry. And I'm going in there to clean her up. And then I found out as I was cleaning her up that these two fingers right here at the first joint were cut completely off. Right here, got all the nail and got part of the nail root. And uh, I don't know how it happened. Apparently in the nursery. I haven't got that information yet. But I can see these two fingers. Now, Terry is about 13 months old. She's still crawling around. And when I saw that, fear tried to grip me. I mean, this is my baby. And uh, fear tried to grip me. But I had read a scripture that morning uh, before going to church. And, and once again, I'm relatively new to all this. And that scripture said, Jude 20, building up your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. So I had learned from Brother Copeland in some of his messages that faith replaces fear. You can't have faith and fear at the same time. One will negate the other. And so I started praying in the Spirit. And sure enough, faith came and fear left. And then I said, because Brother Copeland had taught me and he learned it from Kenneth Hagin. Mark eleven twenty three, 23. If you believe in your heart, not doubt, in, if you say with your mouth and not doubt in your heart, you can have those things which you say. So I said out loud, in the name of Jesus, my God will restore my baby's fingers. Amen. Now, I'd never seen God do that before. I'd never heard of God restoring fingers that had been cut off. But my faith was decreeing that my God will restore my baby's fingers. Amen. I just dared believe that God could do anything. See, I hadn't been going to church long enough to find out that's all passed away. But anyway, uh, I just believe God could do anything. Uh, T.L. Osborne told me one time, he said, what I love about you, Brother Jerry, is you still have that young faith. I said, what do you mean by young faith? He said, that faith that came when you first made Jesus the Lord of your life and you dared to believe he could do anything. Amen. Well, that's, that's a good thing to have young faith. Hallelujah. Amen. And so I sat in that bathroom and I wrote it in the front of my Bible that my God will restore my baby's fingers according to Mark eleven twenty three. 23. Yeah. About that time, there was a knock on the door. The nursery attendant said, Brother Jerry, can I come in? 
She came in. She said, I went back to the nursery and I found these under the rocking chair. Now, this lady was a heavy set woman and she rocked over Terry's fingers. Terry crawled under the rocking chair and she, the nursery attendant had another baby in her arm. She rocked over Terry's fingers and cut them both off. And she found these little fingertips under the rocking chair and she puts them in the palm of my hand. Now, have you ever seen your baby's fingertips in the palm of your hand? Fear tried to grip me again. So what did I do? Prayed in the Holy Spirit again. Fear left, faith came. And I said it again. My God will restore my baby's fingers. I took those fingertips, put them in a piece of tissue, and put them in my shirt pocket. And I went back into the service. Why? Because I learned from Brother Copeland in those meetings. When you're, when, you're, when you're under attack, don't run from God, run to God. Don't run from the Word, run to the Word. So I went right back in there, not only that, but faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word. And as soon as he got through preaching, he came up to me and he said, and he still don't know what's happened. He said, what do you believe? I said, my God will restore my baby's fingers. He said, then I set myself in agreement with you. And then he sh I showed him what had happened. He said, now I suggest or recommend that you take her to the hospital, get them properly dressed. You can't leave those fingers exposed like that. And then he said this, and this is the most important thing he told me. But when you get there, don't let them talk you out of what you're believing for. Now, I didn't realize how important that was until I got to the hospital. And so uh, they turned us over to uh, a man by the name of Dr. Simon Wall. This is all documented. Dr. Wall was considered to be one of the top plastic surgeons in the state of Louisiana at that time. He examined Terry's fingers. I gave him the fingertips he said, I can't do anything with these. I can't reattach them. And I watched him take my baby's fingertips and throw them in the waste bin. Now, I, I haven't been saved very long. I, I'm not totally sanctified yet. I came this close to knocking the fire out of him. And I thought, well, I can get forgiveness later. The guy threw my baby's fingers in the waste bin. And I just gritted my teeth and held myself, and I, I knew Carolyn could see, you know, like Jesse says, the, the hot sauce was going all the way to the top, you know. <laughs> but I, 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 I contained myself, and I said, well, what are you going to do? He said, the only thing I can do is take a skin graft. I'll take some skin from her hip, and I'll cover those two fingers up. They'll never be normal again. They'll never have nails again. And then I remember what Brother Copeland said. Don't let them talk you out of what you're believing. And I said, sir, uh, I'm not trying to be a smart aleck. Uh, I appreciate your expertise and all the education you apparently have in, in, in becoming what you are, but I don't accept that. My God will restore my baby's fingers. He said, sir, that is impossible. I said, not with my God. Now, I noticed when we went through his office, he had Buddha statues. And I said, uh, sir, not with my God. Now, with your God, that would be impossible, but not with my God. My God specializes in what men say is impossible. Amen. Now, I'm, I'm saying all this right out of my spirit. My faith is talking because I've never seen God do anything like this. But from what I can see in the Bible, God does things like this. Even though I don't have an example from the Bible of him re, re, restoring fingers, but if he is El Shaddai, if he's the God in whom nothing is impossible, then that have to include restoring my baby's fingers. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. Amen. And so finally he went to Carolyn and he said, your husband is in shock. He doesn't understand that this is medically impossible. She said, sir, you don't understand. Our God will restore our baby's fingers. I said, sir, you do what you can do, and then our God will take it from there, okay? 
So you just go ahead and do the skin graft. So he took her into surgery, did the skin graft, and then told us to keep her there overnight. And uh, I said, Carolyn, you stay with Terry tonight. I'm going back to the church. Brother Copeland has one more service tonight. I'm going to go hear him preach. And as soon as he's done, I'm going to come back to the hospital and I'm going to preach to you word for word what I heard him say. I'll take notes because I want our faith on the same level. Amen. I don't, I don't want me believing one thing and Carolyn believing something else or her believing one thing and me believing something else. We want to be in agreement. And so we did just that. The next morning he released Terry and told her to bring her, bring us, bring her back in six or eight weeks, I believe it was. And so during that time, we are believing God for a miracle. We did not turn the television set on one time during that time. We did not pick up a newspaper one time during that time. We did not allow unbelieving believers in our house during that time. And some of them tried to come. You know, well-meaning people. But when they say, we don't know why God cut your baby's fingers off. I said, there's the door. You better get out quick. Oh, I made a lot of people mad. But I didn't care at the moment. This is my baby. This is my miracle. If you're going to talk unbelief, Get out of my house. We don't need your unbelief. Now, I apologize to him later, but right now, I don't have time for that. I'm believing for a miracle. Amen. And later I found out Jesus did that one time at Jairus' at Jairus's house. He run them all out. They were hooping and hollering and wailing, and he said, get them out. <laughs> we don't need all that unbelief in here. Amen. Well, we just, we just stayed firm on our confession, just kept feeding our spirit the Word of God. The night before, we were to take her back to the doctor. We got a little card in the mail from Kenneth Hagen Ministries that he was going to be in Tyler, Texas for one night, that night. I'd never met Kenneth Hagen. I'd heard Brother Copeland talk about it. I certainly wouldn't known Kenneth Hagin's mailing list. I wouldn't known Kenneth Hagin from Adam. And I don't know how I got that card. But I told Carolyn, I said, this is the man Brother Copeland listens to and talks about frequently in his sermons. If he listens to him, we need to listen to him. We're going to Tyler tonight. And so we, it was about 100 miles away, and we drove to Tyler and got in that service. Brother Hagin preached on Mark 11, 23 and 24. And by the time we got out of that service, we didn't even need a car to get home. We were higher than a Georgia pine tree. <laughs> Our faith was, I mean, it, it was, it was, it was kicking. Hallelujah. We got to that hospital the next morning. Dr. Simon Wall cut those bandages off, lifted both hands and screamed, my God. I said, what is it, sir? He said, look. The fingers were back. The nails were back. You couldn't even tell they'd ever been cut off, praise God. And I said to Dr. Simon Wall, no, sir, not your God, my God, hallelujah. And he got born again over that. His wife got born again over that. And he asked me if he could tell the testimony to his colleagues in a meeting of physicians in Baton Rouge, and he told the whole group that testimony of what he saw God do. God did something impossible. Now, I said that story, shared that story for you, or with you, and for you, because it was a first. And first have a way of marking you for the rest of your life. Amen. That's one of the purpose for God giving you first experiences. They mark you. You never forget them. That's the reason the psalmist said, I will remember your works of old. I've told that story all over the world. I'm still telling it today. It's still inspiring people. I've had people write to me and say, we did the same thing you and Carolyn did with our baby, and we got the same miracle that you guys got. Hallelujah. Amen. It was a first. And what I hear God saying is this. 2021 is going to be a year of first. Things are going to happen in your life this year that have never happened to you quite this way before. 
And I think you ought to give God a, a, a praise in advance for it. Amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on, you can give him a better shout than that. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. There's nothing quite like watching God do something impossible for you for the very first time. Amen. Amen. I have a lot of firsts. Dear Lord, do I have a lot of firsts. First time God blessed us with a debt-free car. Man, that old car we were driving, it was absolutely worn out. I, 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 I moved to Fort Worth to go to work with Brother Copeland in that car. I was so deep in debt from my business, I couldn't afford to buy a better car. In fact, every car I'd ever owned had been wrecked first. I'd never owned a new car that hadn't been wrecked. My dad, when I was young, he, he did paint and body work. He, he rebuilt them. When I learned the trade, I'd go out and buy a wrecked car and rebuild it. You couldn't tell it had ever been wrecked, but sometimes the only one I could afford already was worn out mechanically. But boy, the body looked good. The paint job looked good. <laughs> My dad used to tell me, son, you, you turned out to be a whole lot better painter than I was. And uh, we were driving an old... Uh, 64 O's 98 luxury sedan when I went to work with Brother Copeland. But luxury had left that car a long time ago. <laughs> so now it's just a sedan, you know. And, uh, oh, it smoked. It needed a ring job. It needed overhauling. It clattered. It, 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 the transmission slipped. First time Brother Copeland told me to take him to the airport, come get him at his house and take him to the airport. It was a cold winter day, and the heater didn't work in that car. And I got over to Brother Copeland's house, not only that, but I, I didn't take a chance on turning the engine off because I didn't know if it'd start again. You had to believe God for it to start. My, my car didn't respond to turning on the ignition. You prayed in tongues for at least 30 minutes before you turned the ignition off. And so I, I got it started that morning. I drove over to Brother Copeland's house. And I left it running while I went in and got him and his suitcases, and I'm going to take him to the airport. And uh, so he, I, I got him in the car, and we're driving to the airport. He said, uh, Jerry, uh, turn the heater on. It's cold in this car. I said, Brother Copeland, and it's the first time I got to use this. Brother Copeland? Don't be moved by what you feel. It's on wide open. <laughs> he said, the heater's on. I said, full blast. He said, there's nothing coming out. I said, that's why I told you, don't be moved by what you feel. You have to use your faith in my car. <laughs> and so we drove along there, and now we can see each other's breath as we're talking to each other. Now, he's got, he's got a top coat on. I didn't even know what a top coat was. I came out of a paint and body shop. We don't wear top coats in a paint and body shop. We wear uniforms. And he had on this nice, you know, top coat. And he's sitting over there warm. I, I, I had what I had on, just short sleeve and, and slacks. I'm sitting over there shivering, you know, and, and uh, watching our breath between our conversations. And... Uh, Finally, he got so cold, he said, in the name of Jesus, I command the heater to work in this car. And boy, that thing came on like to run us out of there. I said, Brother Copeland, praise God. Man, that thing responded to your faith. I said, but don't quit using your faith now. The transmission slips. We're coming up to an intersection, and we got to turn left, and the traffic's coming your way. So you better, you better stay on your faith to make sure we get through this intersection. So obviously, we need a car. Amen. Now, I knew I, my faith was not at the level at that time to believe that God could get me a brand new car, debt-free, because he told me don't go in debt anymore. In fact, not only did I learn, you know, staying out of debt from Brother Copeland, I was forced to live debt-free. They wouldn't loan me anymore. <laughs> and so, anyway, uh, I'm believing God for a better car. Now, I, I believe that I could, I could get one that was nice, 
you know, maybe had a few miles on it and uh, a good price, but I wasn't at the level where I, I could believe that I could just believe for a brand new car debt free. So I'm believing for a, a, a better car. And so, you know, we'd never believed God for a car before. This is a first. And I remember uh, this gentleman told me that he had a, a nice car. He'd like to sell it. He said, Jerry, I believe, I believe God wants you to have it. And I looked at it and had low miles on it, nice car. I said, well, what do you want for it? He told me it's a good price. I said, well, sir, I don't, I don't have the money now, but I believe I can believe God for it if you're not in a big hurry to sell it. And he said, well, I believe God wants you to have it. I'll just hold it for you. I said, okay, praise God. And so uh, I'm believing God for it, and every once in a while I'd get a little you know, seed that I could sow to, into somebody else that was believing for a car because every seed produces after its own kind. And so... Uh, you know, some time went by, and he called me and said, uh, Jerry, have you got the money for the car yet? I said, no, sir, I haven't. He said, okay, well, I'm, I'm still in agreement with you. Then he called sometime later and said, have you, have you got the money for the car yet? I said, no, I, I haven't. I'm, I'm still believing for it. He said, well, I, I'm, I'm still in, uh, believing this is your car. And then finally one day he called me, and he said, uh, Jerry, I'm sorry. He said, if you don't have the money for it, I, I've got to sell it. Uh, I, I'm sorry, but I've, I've got to sell it. And I said, well, sir, I understand, so do what you need to do. And when I hung the phone up, it crushed me. It really did. Because I'm still young in faith, see? And I thought, God, I, I was almost positive that that's the car you wanted me to have. The man believed that was the car you wanted me to have. Why didn't it work? Why didn't our faith produce the money that it would take to buy that? And I heard the Lord say, a double-minded man's unstable in all his ways. I said, what? He said, a double-minded man's unstable in all his ways. I said, Lord, uh, let me explain this to you. <laughs> the man said he's selling the car. Okay, he's selling the car. He can't wait any longer. And the Lord said, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, and don't let that man expect to receive anything from God. I said, are you telling me that you want me to continue to believe for this car, even though the man said he's going to sell it? He said, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, and don't let that man expect to receive anything from God. I told Carolyn, I said, I'm not giving up on that car. Told her what the Lord said. And I said, if somebody else buys it, maybe, maybe they'll listen to God and give it to us. But we're not giving up on it. She said, I'm in agreement with you. Well, it was just a couple of days later, the man called me and he said, Jerry, I need to apologize to you. I said, why? He said, God got all over me. He said, he, said, he told me, you know that's Jerry's car and you better do everything in your power to see to it that he gets it. Now, you call him and tell him it's his car. I said, well, thank you, sir. I appreciate that. But I actually had not given up on that car and told him what the gods, uh, God said to me. And he said, why don't you just come on and get it? I know you need it. I said, no, I'm not coming to get it until I can pay cash for it. He said, God's going to get you the money. I know he is. You know he is. Just come on. You need it now. I said, no, I, I'm not going to get it until I can pay you cash for it. And he said, okay, but I just want you to know it's yours. And so I got invited to come do a meeting up in Arkansas. Well, the car I had, it barely makes it from my house to Kenneth Copeland's little office. I don't want to take a chance on driving this thing to Arkansas especially with my wife and my babies in it. And I said, Lord, I, I want to go do this meeting, but I don't know about driving this car to Arkansas. And I said, what am I going to do? He said, I'm working behind the scenes. Just be patient. So in a little while, that man calls me. And he said, Jerry, I just found out 
that you're, you're going up to Arkansas to preach. I said, yes, sir. He said, you're not going in that old car of yours, are you? I said, well, uh, I certainly hope not, but that's all I have at the time. He said, you get over here and get this car right now. I, I wouldn't be able to sleep if I knew you was out on the road with your family in that old dog car of yours. Now, come on over here and get this car. I said, okay, I, I'll do it. And then as soon as I get out of this meeting, I'll bring it back to you. He said, whatever, but it's yours and I know it's yours. And so I went over and got the car and we drove to Arkansas. And oh man, it felt good driving a car that would start <laughs> without praying in tongues first. It, it felt good to drive a car that would stop when you press the brakes. It felt good driving a car that the transmission didn't slip. It just felt good. It, 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 feel, it felt like that car fit us like a glove. And so we went and did that meeting and came back and I was taking it over to his house. When I got to his house, he said, got a surprise for you. I said, what? He said, well, somebody came over and uh, he, they said, uh, Where, where's that car you had for sale? He said, oh, that's Jerry's car. He said, has Jerry got it? And he said, yeah. He, he drove it. I told him to come get it and drive it up to Arkansas to do a meeting in. And he said, and he's believing God to, to buy it and pay cash for it. He said, I just want you to know, he told me not to tell you who it was, but the car is yours. It's been paid for. Here's the title deed. Amen. That was a first. That was a first. First have a way of marking you. From that moment, I never had a problem ever again believing God that he could get me a car. And I have not only gotten good cars, but great cars. And never had to borrow money for them again. Hallelujah. Why? Because first have a way of marking you. If you ever have a first, then you tend to believe that if God could do it one time, why can't he do it another time? Can you say amen? How many of you ever had first in your life? Well, you know what I'm talking about. My first airplane, my goodness, what a miracle that was. Debt-free airplane. It was a miracle. I mean, in the natural, I can't buy an airplane. I don't have the money for an airplane, but God told me I wouldn't be able to fulfill what he's called me to do without airplanes. And little did I know how he was going to do it. But, and I've told some of these stories here, but it's my sermon. I want to hear it again. <laughs> it's inspiring, praise God. We were asked to come to Andrews, Texas. Anybody know where Andrews, Texas is? It's out in West Texas and uh, out near uh, Midland, Odessa. And at one time, way back, a long time ago, it was, it was an old boom town. And, uh, but that had ceased a long time before I got there. And this man invited me to come to Andrews, Texas. And when I got there, Carolyn and the girls were with me. And by this time, I've, I've got a couple of staff members. And they're with me. We all went to Andrews. And when I got there, went to the church I was supposed to preach in. Pastor met me out front. He said, Brother Savell, we're so glad that you could come. We've been looking forward to you being here. And he said, I just need to ask you a question uh, be, before you have your service tonight. Are you licensed and ordained with our organization? He mentioned what denomination he was. I said, no, sir, I'm not. <clears throat> he said, you're not? I said, no, I'm not. He said, well, I thought you were ordained through our organization, our, our denomination. I said, no, sir, I'm not. He said, well, you can't preach in our church. I said, what? Now, I don't, see, I'm so young, I don't know religious politics, okay? He said, you can't preach in our church if you're not ordained with our denomination. I said, sir, you invited me to come. He said, well, I thought you were ordained through our organization, but since you're not, you cannot preach in our church. And he turned around and walked off and left me on the front steps. And the deacon that was standing there with him he said, Brother Swell, I am so sorry. I had no idea my pastor would react this way. He said, if I can find a place in Andrews for you to do this meeting, will you stay? I said, that's what I came for. 
He said, now, Andrews is a small town, and I don't know what we can find, but I'll find something. And uh, he said, you go ahead and go to that hotel that you were supposed to stay in, and I'll call you a little later this afternoon. So family and I went to the hotel. He called me and he said, would you come and look at this uh, building that I found? It's the only place I can find. I said, okay, where is it? He said, come down Main Street, uh, 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 Andrews, Main Street. You got the picture? Main Street. <laughs> There's a Main Street. Very few other streets. Okay. And he said, come to the laundromat. I said, the laundromat? He said, yeah. So I drove up there, Carol and I drove up there, and we parked out in front of the laundromat and saw him inside and his wife, I assumed, and one other person. He said, Brother Jerry, this is the only place I can find for us to have this meeting. It was an abandoned laundromat. The, the washers and dryers are still in the place. I said, how are we going to have a meeting here? He said, we're going to move all the washers up against that wall. We're going to move all the dryers up against this wall. We're going to leave one of them for your pulpit. <laughs> now, this has all the characteristics of a landslide meeting. <laughs> Amen. I said, uh, what, where are we going to get some chairs? He said, well, that's another problem. He said, uh, I can't find anybody in this town that has any folding chairs we can borrow. I said, well, what are we going to do? He said, you'll like this part. He said, I have a friend who has a salvage yard, and he's going to let us come get cars, uh, seats out of wrecked cars. We're going to move them into the <laughs> laundromat for people to sit on. Now, if you don't think I've paid my dues, <laughs> I am now in an abandoned laundromat with seats out of wrecked cars for people to sit on. And the laundromat was musty, smelly. I don't know if anybody will come. And so we have the opening night, and I'm supposed to be there for three days, three services a day. And when we get there that night, the only people that were there was me, Carolyn, Jerry Ann, Terry, uh, one employee, and his wife. And the man who arranged for this spectacular building and his wife. And that was the crowd. Now, I preached. The Bible says be instant in season and out of season. I preached like the place was full. And then I received the offering. My family didn't even give. It was a terrible offering. <laughs> Took all of three seconds to count it. <clears throat> and so the next morning at 10 o'clock, we have a service. Now, we lost one. His wife had to work. <laughs> so my family and staff are there and him, but we lost his wife. She didn't get to come. And then he didn't get to come that afternoon. So now it's just me preaching to my family and two staff members. And the offering was even worse. <clears throat> and then that night, we started having, you know, a crowd. Seven people showed up in addition to us. And then as we progressed, other people started coming. But the last day, the last afternoon. Now, you got to picture this. I'm in a laundromat. Main Street is out front. There's glass window, windows all in the front of this laundromat. So I'm, I'm in the back of this laundromat with a broken down dryer as my pulpit. <laughs> and I can see all the activity taking place on Main Street. People walking by the laundromat. They knew it had been abandoned for a long time. And they'd walk up and put their face up against it, <laughs> look in there and see what's going on in the laundromat. And I'd see them, I'd motion for them to come on in and they'd walk on down the road. But that last service, there was a pickup truck pulled up in front of the laundromat. And in that truck was a very, very large man. He had on a straw hat, had on bib overalls, a bandana around his neck, looked like he'd just come off the farm. And I saw him get out of the truck, and he walked into the laundromat 
took his straw hat off, and he just kept walking up front. He didn't stop and take a seat. I said, sir, would you like to take a seat or two? <laughs> I mean, he's he a large man, you know. <laughs> he said, now, I'm going to do my best to sound like this man. I'm a country boy, but this boy is country. I mean, you know, the June bugs don't show up till August where he come from. A little humor, come on, help me. He said, I said, would you like to take a seat, sir? He said, no, I wouldn't. He said, I was out plowing my field. God spoke to me and told me there's a young preacher boy in the laundromat in Andrews that needs an airplane. Are you him? I said, there couldn't be two of us doing this. <laughs> Not in Andrews. I said, I must be him. He said, well, I was out plowing my field. I said, I got that part. I said, what is your name? He said, my name is Oop. I said, pardon me? My name is Oop. Oop? <laughs> Only other Oop I'd ever heard was Allie, Allie Oop, you know? <laughs> I said, well, Mr. Oop, what did God tell you? I was out plowing my field, riding my track. I said, I got that part. And God told me there's a young preacher boy in Andrews in the laundromat. What needs an airplane? Are you him? I said, yes, sir, I am him. He said, well, God told me to bring you some money for that airplane. And he started taking money out of them bib overalls and just piled it at my feet, took money out of that straw hat and piled it at my feet. And then he put his straw hat back on and said, now, I've done what God told me to do, and you'll never see me again unless God tells me. You understand that, sonny boy? <laughs> I said, yes, sir. And he got out, walked out, got in his truck and drove off. We're all standing there with our mouth open. I said, Carolyn, did this really happen? Did I imagine this? She said, look at your feet. And he piled money up in my feet. Now, it wasn't enough to buy an airplane, but it was enough to get my hanger and it was enough to, uh, to, to rent the hangar for a year. And it was enough to get some equipment that I would need when the airplane manifested. But the point is, Oop was the very first person who sowed a seed in that airplane. It was a first. Amen. Now, what does first do? First inspire you. First mark you. From that moment, I knew that I knew that I knew that my airplane was on his way. Amen. Fred Price and I were preaching in Omaha, Nebraska shortly after that. Carolyn and, and uh, uh, Betty were with us. We preached up there in a faith conference for a week. And then we went to the Omaha airport and Fred and Betty were going to fly back to L.A. and Carolyn and I were going to fly back to Dallas-Fort Worth. And we, we did our hugs and loved on each other. And... They went one direction, and Carol and I went the other. All of a sudden, it just hit me. I don't know how to explain it. It just hit me. I knew that I knew when I got home, my airplane would manifest. I turned and shouted at Fred Price. Now, there are people in the airport. They're all going different places. I cupped my hands, and I said, Fred, Fred, hey, Fred. And finally, he turned around and said, hey, what is it, brother? I said, I just want you to know when I get home, I'll have my own airplane. He said, I believe it, brother. And we walked on to the, turn, to the gate, got home, and when we got out of the airplane, got our luggage, one of my uh, staff picked me up and said, you got a call, and people want to meet you in Dallas tonight for dinner. Now, this is way back. This is 1975. You don't have cell phones. You had to stop at a service station for a payphone or something. And they left a number and said, call them and let them know if you can make that dinner date tonight. I thought, well, I'm almost in Dallas. Sure, we might as well go now. So we called and told them we'd be there. They told us where to meet them. When we got there, and I don't mind telling you who it was, it was Wes and Vicki Jamison. And along with them was Charles and Peggy Caps when we got to the restaurant. We sat down, and uh, I sat next to Vicky, 
And uh, we ordered our food, and they started bringing it out. And Vicky said, Brother Jerry, the reason that we wanted you to meet us tonight is because God told Wes and I a year ago to give you our airplane. But we couldn't do it because we still had debt on it, and God told us to do it when it was debt-free. So we've been believing God for one year now to pay this airplane off because we knew you needed it, and we, were, we wanted to get it into your hand. Now, that, that also gave me great revelation that God's always working behind the scenes. Even when you don't know it, even when it doesn't look like it, he's always working behind the scenes. Amen. And they said, uh, and so we've been believing to pay this airplane off so we could give it to you. And said, and Charles and Peggy called and said they were coming to Dallas, wanted to know if they could spend the night with us. So last night at dinner time, we were all sitting at the table and we shared with Charles and Peggy and wanted them to agree with us because... Uh, you, you, you and Charles have been good friends, preached together a lot. And so uh, we, we knew Charles thought the world of you, and we just wanted them to set themselves in agreement with us. And said, Charles asked, well, how much do you owe on it? And they said, we're down to $8,000. That's all we got left to pay on this plan, and, and we'll be able to give it to Jerry. He turned to Peggy and said, well, Peggy, that's the tithe that we set aside. That's how much tithe we've set aside. Let's give it. To, to Vicky and Wes so they can pay the airplane off. And they said, call Jerry and tell him to meet us at dinner tomorrow so we can give him the good news. And so while we're sitting there and they tell me this story, I was presented with my first airplane. It marked me. It marked me. Amen. Not only that, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Because you, you, you are going like this. First are God's way of helping you break barriers. Every time you experience a first, it's designed by God to be a barrier breaker. That first airplane broke barriers. That was 10 debt-free airplanes ago. It broke a barrier. And what happened? When that first one came, then I was thoroughly convinced, as Paul would say, fully persuaded that if God could do it once, he could do it again and again and again and again and again. And again. Amen? First are barrier breakers. How many of you need to break some barriers this year? How many of you are believing for some barriers to be broken? Well, I want you to grab hold of this word that it is a year of first. God is going to do some things for you this year that have never been done in your life and not quite the way it's going to happen. Will anybody mix their faith with that and receive it? Praise God. Won't you lift your hands and say, I receive that in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, let me, let me give you, now, that's just a couple of testimonies. I've got, dear Lord, We'd be here for the rest of the year if I told you all the first that I have experienced in 52 years. But, but I want to I give you, before we uh, conclude tonight, I want to give you some things that I've written down about first. First are things or events that are new, unique, and out of the ordinary and that you've never experienced quite that way before. I want to say it again. First, are new, unique, out of the ordinary events that you have never experienced quite that way before. Now, I want you to go with me very quickly. I know our time is getting away. Go with me to Luke chapter 5 very quickly. Luke chapter 5. And I want to, I want to point out a phrase in this story that I want you to get used to saying because it's something you're going to be saying for the rest of this year and beyond. Are you ready? Luke chapter 5, and uh, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read all the story, but you will be familiar with it. Jesus is preaching in a home. 
And the Bible says the place was packed out with doctors of the law, Pharisees, religious people. And there was some men who had a friend who had the palsy. He was crippled. He couldn't walk. And they heard that Jesus was in this house preaching. And they went to their friend's house and got him and brought him back in a, a cot, so to speak, a bed. And they brought him back to where Jesus was preaching. Now, you picture this. These, these two men, at least two men, are carrying their friend in a bed or a cot to the house where Jesus is preaching. When they get there, the Bible says they sought means to get in. But the place is so packed out that they cannot get in the front door. I picture them going around to the windows. And when they see, there's no way to get in through the windows because the place is so packed out. But it did not detour them. They began to think, how can we get in here and get our friend in the presence of Jesus? Because we know if he gets in the presence of Jesus, he will be healed. Amen. And so eventually they climb up on top of the house and begin to tear the roof off. Amen. And they start lowering him down in the presence of Jesus. And the Bible says, when Jesus saw their faith, how I many of you know faith can be seen through actions? When Jesus saw their faith, he said several things to him, but then he said, take up your bed and walk. And the man was instantly healed. Now here's the phrase I want you to see in this story. Look at verse uh, 26. They were all filled or they were, they were all amazed and they glorified God and they were filled with fear or awe, saying, now underline or highlight this phrase, saying, we have seen strange things today. We have seen strange things today. The message translation says it this way, we have never seen anything like this. We have never seen anything like this. So what does that make it? A first a first. Write that phrase down. I've never seen anything like this. Get used to saying it because you're going to have some firsts this year. Those of you that will mix faith with the word preach, you're going to have some firsts this year and other people are going to hear you say and other people are going to say right along with you, I've never seen anything like this. I have never seen anything like this. Won't you practice a little bit and say, I have never seen anything like this. Say it again. I've never seen anything like this. Can you say it one more time? I've never seen anything like this. Before you close your eyes and go to sleep tonight, let that be the last thing you say. I'm getting ready to see things I've never seen before. I'm getting ready to see things I've never seen before. When you wake up in the morning, first thing you get up, say, I'm about to experience things I've never experienced before. This is my year for first, hallelujah. Give the Lord a shout if you receive it. Amen. Now, let me, let me tell you some other things about first. Each first that we experience in our life makes a tremendous impact on your faith. Makes a tremendous impact on your faith. First are like milestones. They're significant. Significant events in our lives that, once again, mark us and you never forget them. And, the, and, and I use them actually as a weapon. I do. What do you mean by that, Brother Jerry? Well, same thing David did when he faced Goliath. He reminded himself of a first. Amen. Because that first marked him, and it inspired his faith that he could take Goliath. What did he do? He remembered how God delivered him from the lion and the bear. That was a first. And he used it as a weapon. Amen. And I've done that. Uh, in fact, uh, particularly with my believing for my next airplane, I'd say, God, you did it before. You used, you used oop in Andrews, Texas. 
to put the first dime I'd ever received in my aviation account. And then you use Vicky and Wes and Charles and Peggy to get that airplane in my hands. And Satan, I'm telling you, if God can do it, if God did it before, he can do it again. Amen. If you don't believe it, devil, just hide and watch. Hallelujah. Right. Amen. Amen. I use it as a weapon. So, once again, first are significant. They're milestones. God never intended for us to live ordinary, commonplace, not exceptional lives. I'm going to say it again. God never intended for us to live ordinary, commonplace, not exceptional lives. Amen. And then let me remind you of this. Isaiah 42 and Isaiah 43 both say, Isaiah speaking in God's behalf, Behold, I will do new things. Behold, I will do new things. Well, I wrote in my Bible right there where it says, I will do new things. I wrote in my Bible, if he was the God of new things in Isaiah's day, then he's the God that can still new, do new things in Jerry's day. Hallelujah. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? Look at somebody and tell them, my God amen. is the God of new things. Amen. Well, if he's the God of new things, then you ought to be experiencing some of them sometime. Amen. Are you still here? Yes. He's the God of new things, praise God. And then it goes on to say, and before they spring forth, I'll tell you of them. Well, that's what he did. He told me in advance that this would be a year of first. And what are first? New things. New things that God is about to do in your life. So get God out of your box. Don't limit him to how he's done it before. Don't, don't, don't tell God how you want him to do it. Amen. Just get up every day and saying, God, I have not a clue how you're going to do this, but I know you and you're the God of new things, so I just want you to know I'm open to surprises. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? Come on, give the Lord another good shout of praise. <clears throat> praise God. Amen. Now, once again, first are designed by God to break barriers. And then I want you to write this down if you're taking notes. Every time a barrier is broken, it has a domino effect. Yes. <clears throat> Every time a barrier is broken, it has a domino effect. You ever stood up dominoes and pushed one and watched them all fall? Let me give you this story in closing. I might close. <laughs> I read a book by Robert Schuller many, many years ago. I had the privilege of meeting Dr. Schuller in, in Honolulu one time. And uh, the book was titled, Tough Times Never Last, But Tough People Do. It's a great book. And he was a great motivator. And uh, he, he gave the story in the book, and I just want to relate that story to you, of a man named Mallory from England who led an ex addition to attempt to conquer Mount Everest in the 1920s. The first attempt failed as well as the second attempt. Then he tried a third attempt and took some other folks with him. And as a result, they were all killed in an avalanche. The few, uh, the few that had stayed in camp and didn't go the rest of the way that, that particular time they, the ones who survived, they returned to England and held a banquet in Mallory's honor and in honor of those that were killed with him. They stood up and declared, now listen to what they said in the, in the presence of all these people. They, they, they said out loud, Mount Everest, you defeated us once. You defeated us twice. You defeated us three times. But we shall defeat you someday. Because you can't grow any bigger, but we can. That's good, praise God. Now listen to this. A few decades later, a man by the name of Edmund Hillary led an expedition along with another man, and they made it 
to the summit of Mount Everett. And since that time, more than 7,000 other people have successfully climbed Mount Everett. My point is this. First are barrier breakers. And once a barrier is broken, it has a domino effect. The man who finally broke the four-minute mile. <laughs> you know, after that, junior high kids were breaking it. <laughs> Once a barrier is broken, it has a domino effect. Well, get ready. Get your dominoes out and play with them a little bit. <laughs> Line them all up and just push them down and say, that's exactly what I'm going to experience with miracles this year. That's, ex that's exactly what I'm going to experience with major breakthroughs this year. That's what uh, I'm going to experience with, with finances coming into my life and in my business and in my ministry this year. I'm going to have barrier-breaking manifestations of the goodness of God, not once, not twice, but throughout the year and beyond, and I believe I'll go ahead and shout in advance and thank you for it. Come on, let's do that, praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Did you receive something tonight? Yes. Look at your neighbor and say, get ready, get ready for some first. Praise God. Yes. Amen. All right, now, before I close, I, I have the privilege of, of leading you in, in your sowing tonight. There is a, a law that states, for every action, there is a reaction. Now, Sir Isaac Newton is credited for discovering that law, but it was in the Bible long before Isaac Newton ever came along. For instance, Luke 6, 38, give and it shall be given unto you. Action causes reaction, amen. Men shall give into your bosom. Action and a reaction. Proverbs 3, 9, and 10. Honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruits of thine increase. That's your action. Here's the reaction you'll get. So shall your barns be filled with plenty and your presses shall burst with new wine. Amen. It's the law of action and reaction. Now, in 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 30, God speaking, for them that honor me, I will honor. Action and reaction. Can you see it? Amen. Amen. Now, that's, that's the principle upon which we sow. We sow knowing that our action of sowing is going to cause a reaction from God. Seed that isn't sown is, uh, is seed that's not growing. Amen? If you have financial needs in your life, you're believing God for certain things in your life, and you're not sowing seed toward it, toward it then that's seed that's not growing. Can you say amen? amen? You know, you can go to a seed store and find all kinds of seed. Cotton seed, tomato seed, corn seed, you know. And you can buy a bushel full of it and bring it back home, set it in the garage, and tell everybody, I got seed. I got a garage full of seed, but it won't grow. It won't produce anything until you sow it. Amen? Amen. There, are, there are Christians that are believing God for some big things this year. And I'm believe, I, I, I feel that there are many in here that are believing for some big things this year. And this is how you position yourself to experience them from God, is this law of action and reaction. You sow, and he reacts to your sowing. You honor him in your sowing, and he, in turn, will honor you. That's how Carol and I have acquired everything that we have. 
It's how our ministry has acquired everything that it has. It's through the law of seed time and harvest. I've been asked many times, what is the greatest law that you believe you've ever learned? I don't hesitate. The law of seed time and harvest. It's gotten me where I am today, and it's going to take me where I want to go tomorrow. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Now, I'm going to leave this with you. How many of you would like to see more first this year? Amen. Let me see those hands again. Okay. To experience more first in your life, <clears throat> why don't you be God's vessel to make some first happen in other people's lives? I was down in Florida preaching at a church I'd never been to before. It's the first time I'd ever met the pastors. And after a morning service, a Sunday morning service, they wanted to take me out to lunch before they took me back to the hotel and, and come back to preach that night. And they asked me what kind of food I wanted. And I'm, I'm, I'm easy. And I said, I, I, I'm not particular. You just choose something. They said, well, we heard you like Cheesecake Factory. I said, say no more. You heard from God. <laughs> and said, uh, now, it, it, it's a little bit of a distance to the Cheesecake Factory, but we'd be happy to take you there if you want to go. I said, yeah, let's go. So we went there. And it was in an open mall area, okay, where they got a lot of shops. So we park, and we're walking up to the Cheesecake Factory. We'd pass by it as we went into the parking lot, and then we parked, and we're walking back to it. Now, walking back to it, <clears throat> uh, I noticed his wife stopped at the Louis Vuitton shop and was looking in the window. And he said, come on, honey, we got, we got to go because we got to get Brother Jerry back. Well, it took her a little while to walk away from that window, you know. <laughs> and so uh, I just made a mental note of that. So we had our meal, and then afterwards, we're walking back. So we walked right back by that Louis Vuitton store. And uh, I said, uh, something in there got your attention. She said, oh, yeah. She said, every time I walk by here, I have to look at that purse. I said, uh, do you have a Louis Vuitton purse? She said, no. She said, I'm believing for one. I said, read, and I look at that one every time I come by here. I said, well, let's go in there and see what we can do. She said, what? I said, yeah, let's go in there and see what we can do. So we walked in, and I asked her to point the purse out to the person. And they brought it out, set it on the counter. And she looked at it and she said, uh, oh, yeah, this is beautiful. I said, is this the one you want? She said, it's the one I want. And I'm believing for it. I said, well, praise God, your faith has just produced it. I'm going to buy it for you. She said, what? I said, I want to buy it for you. She said, you can't do that. You're our guest speaker. I said, where does it say anywhere in the <laughs> rules that the guest speaker can't buy the pastor's wife a purse? I said, I want to buy that purse for you. And so I finally convinced her that, that I wanted to do it. And she bought it, and oh, she clutched it. She didn't want it in a bag. She wanted, she, she emptied that other purse and just put all the stuff in there and carried it out, you know. And she said, and when we got in the car, she said, this is a first for me. I said, oh, Get ready, get ready. We just broke a barrier. And the last time I was there, she, caught, she came to the service and she had three other Louis Vuitton purses on her desk and she wanted me to go to her office before I went to the pastor's office. And she said, look what the Lord has done. Hallelujah. I said, boy, you broke some barriers, didn't you? Amen. Amen. Well, now, what, what, what's, that, what's that story have to do with me? Well, not long after that, Carol and I went to Hawaii on vacation. By the way, during the millennium, I will be governor of the Hawaiian Islands, so <laughs> I'm already giving you an invitation to come visit us, okay? And uh, I even have a ball cap. It's got all the islands on it. Right on the bottom, it says governor. <laughs> but anyway, Carol and I have been going to Hawaii for years and years and years, and we have lots of friends over there. We, we preach over there, and, and we... we, we develop some wonderful relationships, stay in the same hotel every time we go. And Louis Vuitton knows me well. 
I got this over there. <laughs> and uh, when they found out, when they found out I was there, shortly after I'd bought those purse, that purse for that pastor's wife, they didn't know about that part, but they'd heard that we had checked in the hotel. So we, we got settled, and then we were going to go have dinner. And so when we came back to the hotel, in my room were Louis Vuitton bags filled with all kind of goodies, gifts from Louis Vuitton. <laughs> Carolyn said, well, when did you buy all this? I said, I didn't buy it. I've been with you the whole time. I said, they heard I was here. <laughs> See, uh, they were planting seed. They know I don't leave Honolulu without buying something from Louis Vuitton. And they were already sowing seed. They were creating an action, knowing that it was going to produce a reaction. And they got a reaction. Oh, they got a reaction. In fact, coming out of the airport, uh, going through security, uh, I, got my, I had to get my baggage checked. Something set it off. And uh, I'm pulling my Louis Vuitton roll-on up to the counter to put it through security. And something set it off. And they said, you need to come down at the end so we can check your bag. Well, I also had a Louis Vuitton briefcase. And they said, put that up there as well. So when we got down to the other end, <laughs> they unzipped my bag, and when they opened it up, everything in there was Louis Vuitton. <laughs> Louis Vuitton phone case, Louis Vuitton everything. They said, do you work for Louis Vuitton? I said, no, but I sure do keep them in business. <laughs> so what were those people doing at the store in Honolulu? They understand the law of action and reaction. My grandson said to me, Papa, you have got to be the only person in the world that Louis Vuitton sends gifts to your room every time you go to Hawaii. I said, yeah, I don't know why I'm God's favorite. I just am. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. My point in all that story is there is a spiritual law. Isaac Newton didn't come up with it. God did. Every action causes a reaction. You're going to sow tonight into what Mac had said to you earlier about believing for the million dollars over and above the budget to get this aircraft up to speed. And, and I want to encourage you to, to do it. Help him get it done. It, it's been too long sitting and not being able to be used and another thing is, one of the worst things you can do to an airplane is let them sit. So it needs to be in the sky. Airplanes were not made to sit in hangars. They're made to fly. Amen. And you're going to help him get it in the air. And it's not, it's not just so he can have fun, even though he enjoys flying, but it's a tool, a tool for ministry. It's a tool for reaching souls. It's a tool for evangelism. And you have a part in that. And as you act, then God is going to react to your action. You're honoring him and he's going to honor you. And you just get ready. Some major breakthroughs are going to come your way. Oh, here, I just heard this. You're going to make something happen for Mac and this church that they've been believing for for a long time. Hey, you help make it happen and God's going to make something happen for you that you've been believing for for a long time. That's just the way it works. Every action causes a reaction. Will you receive that tonight? Give the Lord a good shout of praise. Amen. Get your offering ready. <clears throat> and Brother Mac, I'll turn it to you and let you receive it. Amen. Right. Thank you. Hey, y'all give Jerry a good round of applause. Amen. We have just been treated to 52 years of wisdom and anointing and empowerment by God. So thank you so much for your words tonight. Uh, there are envelopes on the seats in front of you if you're here tonight uh, for your giving, convenience in your giving. If you're 
joining us online, please be a part of this process. See all the various ways you can give right there on your screen. And I want to thank you in advance for uh, being a part of our life, both here in this meeting tonight, whether you're present or online, and uh, for participating in what God's called us to do, to go to the world. Let's pray before we receive the offering. Father, we so thank you for this opportunity to invest in your kingdom, to invest in the outreaches of this ministry, to invest in causing the word to go into all of the world. Lord, we see that airplane as an instrument in your hands to promote your purpose. And we believe this is just the first step. It's as we step out in this, in this arena that the nonprofit airline you have unveiled to our hearts in years past will indeed come to pass on a scale that dwarfs whatever, what, what you can even imagine right now. This is the first step. We thank you for the privilege of being participants. Uh, we dedicate these tithes and offerings with, to your work and your service. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.